Welcome to Dead Air, hosted by James Bembridge and his lucky Sean Walsh. Uh, today, you. Uh, probably, you know, I like to big you up. Uh, today's guest. Be promoted. Is, yeah, today's guest is Gary McGee, scriptwriter of Silent Witness fame. Welcome, Gary. Howdy. Actually, first of all, I want to talk about, and this will surprise you, Sean, I want to talk about myself. And what happened? Astonishing. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened to me last night? Well, so Gary recommended this lovely French restaurant to me to go to last night. Last night being Valentine's, so I went there with two of my female friends. I've told you about them before. These are the ones who discovered opinions and keep sharing them with me. So it was a French restaurant, and one of my fr female friends was like, isn't having carbs, so she was happy that it was French restaurant, you know, because you can have steak tartare or something. Quite easy to do low carb options. Is this going to go on for a long time, James? No, shut up. Right. <laughs> so she went. She wanted to go there because she wasn't eating carbs, and yet every time I looked at her, she was tearing bread from crust like lions do flesh from bone. If she got, if she worked herself up into a completely carb crazed frenzy, and the waiters there, they kept on, you know, casting sympathetic looks my way whenever she demanded another bread. Oh, it's going to go on for a long time. All right. And then oh, they put eyeliner. James, can, James, can you fast forward to what happened to the Groucho Club and presumably oh, got plastered? We were, we were absolutely plastered by that point. In fact, yeah. I can't even remember who we met there now. I mean, again, the whole reason of going to the Groucho Club is to get dirt on celebrities, and I can't remember what happened at all. What's going to happen, James, when you are a bona fide celebrity and people are going there to get dirt on you? Mm. That'll never happen, because I, I get ahead of the scandals by writing about them myself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mind so, you, you know, one, one of the things you can say about celebrities, James, is that they do only have one topic of conversation, mm. which is themselves. Yes. Well, no, I'm not going so, to talk about myself anymore. I'm going to talk about... Oh, okay. okay, so you got absolutely plastered, and so you've had a hangover today. And yes. guess what? Zero sympathy incoming. But it's not just the hangover, Gary. I can't seem to remove this eyeliner that they put on me. <laughs> Did they put it on your eyes? Okay, all uh, right, let's not anyway, go there. Uh, uh, don't degrade the conversation into filth and... How is that possible? How is that possible to degrade this conversation, James? <laughs> you started off with saying, I don't want to talk about myself. We've had 10 minutes about your evening <laughs> yeah. outlooks. He's well on the way to becoming a, a, a core celebrity. All about James. And no, 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 Gary, no, it's about you, this podcast. Okay. I want you to talk about script writing, your approach to it, how it's different from, let's say, uh, uh, journalism, mm. journalistic writing, you know, stuff like yeah. that. Okay, and, yeah. And also, if you could... I don't know if you feel comfortable doing this, but touch upon the story that happened with your agent. OK, so what did you want? To, I'm going to try and not make it too technical because it's quite technical script, screenwriting. Mm. But basically how you write scripts is that you start off by having a good idea um, for a story. And then what you do is you throw it down on the page in what's called a treatment and so that can, it depends what you're writing, whether you're writing a pilot script for TV or a feature script or a film, but it should be about six pages long. Cause what you want to do is you want to get the, all of it out there onto the page and then you rewrite it and then you rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. And once it's in decent shape in long form, you then put it into short form. So it goes from six pages boiled down to two pages. Mm. And then you've got two treatments that you can work from. And until, because, you know, script writing, writing is rewriting and script writing is absolutely, totally uh, about rewriting, uh, even more so than prose writing. And so you Got have to, to do it down to its purest form. You, you, you have to do, you have to go through each stage thoroughly and not cut corners. So... Once you've got two really good treatments, a short one and a long one, you can then get your head around writing what's called a scene by scene. So what you do is you work out how you're going to move the furniture around, you know, how the story is going to be coming across visually on the screen. Mm. And so you write the scenes out and you put, you know, where, where, who, where, when, who, what, how, you know, and you write out, you write out the scene in, in, in very abridged form as, as, as minimally as minimalistically as you can. And then 
once you've kind of got the story down in that form, scene by scene, and it's also, you have to think of it not just in terms of scene by scene, but also sequence by sequence as well, which is which is a collection of scenes. So you have a scene and then a sequence might be a dozen scenes one after another, which is a sequence. Because you have to get, you have to get a, a handle on how the story runs, right? Mm. Um, uh, and what and the pace of it that's how you get to grips with with the pace of it because pacing is very important in screenwriting mm. uh, the screenwriting i mean there's kind of rules and the thing is people say oh you can break the rules no you can't you have to learn the rules first and then you can break them not the other way around yes yeah um, um, uh, and so so basically once you've got your scene by scene down you then rewrite and rewrite and rewrite that and make sure that the story's flowing and that it's flying and that it's jumping out of the page at you as it should when it's get when it transfers onto the screen um and so then what then and only then once you've got a really sound scene by scene do you even begin to think about starting to write the actual script so it's quite a it's quite a a, a long um and uh, involved and arduous process mm. um and you have to do it and you have to be a bit mad to be a bit to be a screenwriter because none of that counts what I mean by that is that though these are just tools that you're using to write the script. What counts is the script. So you have to be a bit crazy to kind of go through all that and then just have something that you're just using as a tool that doesn't actually mean anything in terms of, you know, its uh, value to anyone else, to the public or anything else. And then you, and then from that, if that's sound, then you, you can then write, you can then draft a decent script. And guess what I'm going to say about that? Rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. So and, that's basically mm. that's basically the process. And then what you want to get to is what's called a shooting script, which means that you it, it's ready to um, be table read. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Mm -hmm. And that, that it, it's ready to um, shoot. You know, it's ready to be handed out to actors so that they can learn the lines and they can rehearse the, the scenes and they can kind of get to grips with it. And the, and the director can can work out how they want to be, how they want it to be visualized and how they want to shoot it, and so you get that. So that, so the writer hands over what is called a shooting script, and it has to be in really good shape. It can be rewritten. I mean, quite a lot of scripts, you know, they're rewritten on set, you know, or or yeah. they decided they want to do something slightly different, or they want to do something well, very different. When Kubrick was when, when Stanley Kubrick was shooting The Shining, I think he was rewriting scripts almost every day. Yeah, to shoot. Yeah, yeah, well, they do, you do, and you do, and and it's good. It's good that you do because what happens then? Once you've got shooting script, the writer's job is to produce a shoot a script, and the writer's job is to be on set to work with the director usually to uh, make any changes. Or sometimes you just have really good ideas. Actors can sometimes have really good ideas about the character and what the character's going to do. I mean, a good example um, recently happened with Saltburn. I don't know if you've seen yes. that, Sean. Um, yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where, what happened was the the scene where he he fucks the grave, right? <laughs> right. That wasn't in <laughs> the script, was it? It was in. No, 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 no. It wasn't the scene. What the scene where he fucks the grave? What happened was, um, Keon Barry said to 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 I don't understand it to Emerald. I've got a really good idea for this, and I want to do it, but I want it to be a closed set because it's going to be very you know perverse. And she said, go for it. And so what they did was they set up a, this wasn't in the script, the original shooting script. So they set up a, 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 a what they called a closed set. So there was hardly anybody there. It was just camera rolling. And so they, they shot the scene. And of course, he takes all his clothes off and fucks the grave, fucks the soil mm. on the ground. Mm. And that was not in the script. It was just Barry Keown just had this really perverse idea about what he wanted to do in this situation. So that that can that is something that, that quite often happens in films. And sometimes those kind of moments are some of the most iconic moments in, in the movie. So anyway, so that's what you end up with is, is, is a shooting script. Um, and, uh, you know, changes can be made, all sorts of, you know, it, 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 it depends. Sometimes act, actors can be inspired, you know, and they, they know and, and they really get to grips with the character. So if they think that something's not quite right, then they will say so. And they yeah. especially really professionals. They will say so, and they will, and, and a writer worth his salt will recognise immediately that this is this, this will fly. Can I, can I say can I say two things, yeah. Gary? 
Uh, actually, I was going to say three things. The first mm. thing I'm going to say is that's absolutely fascinating. What mm. what what you've just said. I mean, and 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 um, absolutely brilliant. The second thing I'm going to say is a bit more anodyne than that, which is that I was watching an interview with Ricky Gervais the other day, and he oh, made yeah. a similar point, which is that when you write a script, it's done. Yeah. But when you do stand up, it's a developing process. Yes. And yeah. the third thing I was going to say is I'm writing um, an article about the nature of games and sport. Oh, right. And the rules, the rules of sport on the rules of game are in games, sorry, are important because it's within that context that you're allowed to generate a certain amount of creativity. I mean, if you if you look at I mean, 21st century screenplay writing, there's a lot of uh, non-linearity where stories kind of jump all over the place and there's kind of playing around with time and, right. and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, people like Quentin Tarantino. I mean, Quentin Tarantino is very good at good at it, but he learned all the basics. He mm. learned all the basics. He mm. he absolutely learned basics, chapter and verse, before yeah. he even begun to attempt to do that. Yeah. So you, you, you you'd usually have, think you'd, you'd have to be pretty pro proficient to actually make a film like Pulp Fiction, which okay. yeah, yeah. plays you, around you, with the nature of time, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Usually, usually, so playing by the rules, Gary. Every every scene, every every conversation has to advance the story, right? That's right, exactly. It has to, well, it has to move the story forward. Yeah. And the thing is, the thing is, off, off, it's quite, can be quite frustrating. This is another reason why scriptwriters are mad because it's quite frustrating because you have to kill your babies. What I mean by mm. that is mm. that if it, it could be the most fantastic scene you've ever written, really dynamic, really really gorgeous, really brilliant, well conceived, but if it doesn't move the story forward, it's got to go. It's yeah. got to be cut. And so you have to kill your babies. And it is like, you know, lopping off a limb. I mean, it really is. And so, um, yeah, if it doesn't move the story forward, then it's got no, it should it, it should have no place in the script. That's yeah. really, it, well, that's you, really want to, you, want, you want to hear something fascinating and fascinatingly morbid, Sean. Listen to what Gary has to say about his, his ex-agent. Yeah. Why did you murder him? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're giving that a build up, James. No, 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 well, basic, well, I signed to an agent called Rod Hall. Now, you won't have heard of him, um, he was, but he was very well known within sort of literary agency circles, you know, literary mm. agent circles, and very, very successful. And um, I, I worked with a guy called Jim Hill who, um, I don't know if you ever heard of a drama called Boone. Starring yeah, Mike, yeah, I knew Boone. Yeah, yeah, who starred my, starring Michael Elphick. Michael um, Elphick, yeah. Uh, who played, yeah, you know Boone, where he play, he plays a recovering alcoholic ex-fireman who turns into a private investigator or something. Anyway, so anyway, so I worked with Jim, who wrote, created and wrote that. And Jim also wrote and directed several, several episodes of Minder. And he yeah. taught me hmm. how to screenwrite. Jim. He, he taught me how to write for television. Uh, absolutely brilliant. I had virtually had, I mean, it started off, of course, where there were several people, but they all dropped out apart from me. Um, and because it's hard, you know, it's, it's really hard. Mm. And so, and so I had them basically to myself, really. Um, and it was really, really rewarding. And I really learned how to do it well and do it properly. And on the basis of that, I got signed by Rod Hall. I sent him a script uh, now, let me tell you about Rod Hall. He's very, very successful, one of the most successful literary agents in TV and film and, and handling writers and directors. And he was responsible for uh, Simon Beaufoy. Simon Beaufoy is one of his clients. Um, uh, the Full Monty, Billy Elliot, mm -hmm. um, wow. men, behave, men Behaving Badly, etc. A whole raft of, of, of dramas and, and work that was really successful. So he was an incredibly successful agent. Rob. But those are all That's very it. different things, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're just, gone, they're just the really well-known ones. There were lesser-known ones that were also successful in their own right that he was involved with as well. Um, and um, so when he signed, he signed me on the basis of the script that I'd worked on, this, this TV script development process that I'd been through with Jim. Mm. Um, he, he signed me. He rang. You know, I, I left the script. I take. I took the script into his office, and he was there at a weekend, being a workaholic. And um, I handed him the script. And then two days later, I got an email saying, "Come and see me," which was fantastic, as you can probably mm. imagine. It's like mm. you know, cloud nine. Um, and how so, many, how many years were you with him? 
Well, uh, well, I wasn't with him for that long, only for about six, but it was, well, I suppose that's quite a long time in music. So. Mm. But, you know, it, it, he was he was working on me. He was working, you know, he was working with me. I didn't get a big breakthrough, though. That was the thing. It's very, nothing's guaranteed. I mm. didn't get a big breakthrough. What happened at the time when, when, when my um, TV pilot script came out, uh, it was called Salt of the Earth, and it was about a working class gay family uh, who lived in Shepherd's Bush in West London. And it was around the same time that Queer as Folk came out. Uh, okay. All right. That's some competition. <laughs> well, and well, and of course, Russell T had been working in television for years and years, um, and I hadn't. Mm. And also, um, he it, it it was a it was a fuck up. Um, Queer as fuck was a fuck up because there was a scene in the first episode where the main character um, fucks a fifteen year old. And so that was extremely unfortunate because then that just had all the dogs raging. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it okay. is. It is to the worst stereotypes. People who are of gays. Well, no, absolutely. It was. It was really irresponsible. It was. I, I was aghast when I when I saw it. I thought, oh no, that's going to be really disaster. That's just going to be really awful. It's mm. going to be disastrous. Why couldn't he have been sixteen, you idiot, or whatever? Why couldn't he have been eighteen? Or a little older, hopefully. Eighteen. And I just thought. You know, this is, but anyway, what happened was that it didn't get a second series, did it? In fact, what happened was it got a, another two episodes of a second series, but it was, it was green lit for another couple of series, but they were, it was abandoned mm. because of this scene. And, um, and Russell T's just talked a lot of bleary shit about it, you know, saying, oh, well, it was just something in the air. Yeah, what was in the air was that you had a really ill considered scene in the, in the pilot episode, darling. That was mm. awesome. Um, so, and, but it ruined the chances of something like sort of the earth being made, yeah, because yeah. it's too similar. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, sort of the earth was much more working class than uh, Queer's Folk. Um, I mean, Queer's Folk was sort of middle class disco dogs. You know? Yeah. Whereas, sure, where, yeah. whereas, 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 sort of the earth wasn't. You know, the main, you know, the main gay character in, in sort of the earth was a, 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 a bouncer, a nightclub bouncer called Jason. Um, and it was centered around his life and his family, um, uh, you know, which was very different to uh, queer as folk. Um, and your, I was always reluctant your, your, about your I was always reluctant about using the word queer anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I well, yeah as, as I always say, I'm, I'm quite angry to hear now that queer is no longer considered a slur. Apparently, because if it's no longer considered a slur, then that means I've been using it wrong my whole life. Well, you need to go back to William Burroughs for that, James. He wrote a book called Queer. Is that where it came? A long came? time ago, in which he appropriated the term. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But you see, but you see, it had a. But you see, it had a. It, it was. It, it's been completely um, uh, sanitized and completely taken over by an agenda that is is just doesn't serve gay people at all. But anyway, we'll talk about exactly. that. Exactly. I'm open, we'll I'm open. Most of whom are actually straight and just attention-seeking individuals. Yeah, spicy straights. Yeah, yeah. But um, so so basically, um, anyway, to cut a long story short, because um, I haven't got to the, <laughs> the the denouement of this story. Yeah. Um, basically, what happened was so so I so I, you know I was signed by by um, by Rod Hall, which was thrilling, and I and my work got out there. I mean, you know, sort of the earth went out to all the main players in in the industry. But they just wouldn't touch it because of queer as folk. So thanks for that, Russell. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and then I wrote a tennis drama, right, as well. I'll tell you this. I, I wrote a, te a, a TV drama about a tennis player. My pitch was um, Ashley Slater, the opposite Tim Henman. What, you win stuff? <laughs> no, no, no. Tim Henman was like a little goody two-shoes, you, know, um, you know, terribly straight-laced kind of, you know, uh, you know privileged, you know, little kind of, you know, provincial white boy. And Ashley Slater was this rough as fuck, wild boy, working class background, you know, with an attitude. So that was my pitch. It was the opposite of Tim Henneman. I thought it was a great pitch. Anyway, that was scuppered by the release of a film called Wimbledon around the Yeah, I remember that. Which was absolutely dire. It was, it was shite. Absolutely awful. So nobody wanted to know about a tennis drama. <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, you know. So you had it. You had it happen. This is my luck. Yeah. Th this yeah. is this is my luck. Yeah. This is this is yeah. uh, this is what how my luck pans out. Anyway, so the anyway, so the the nadir of my luck came around, Sean, when my agent went and got himself murdered, 
<laughs> well, that, that doesn't help. <laughs> oh. Now, I know, that's a harsh, I, know, I, know, I know that's a harsh way of putting it, but bear with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bear with me. There's no um, way of sweetening this. Anyway, no, carry on. no, no, there isn't. There is no way of sweetening this. <laughs> um, I was, I, I, me and my partner, we had a, we bought a cottage in Wales. And so, and it was great for me because I was able to write, you know, it was really quiet and idyllic. And I was able to go out walking in, in the Berwyn Hills in the morning and then right in the afternoon. Anyway, I get rung up by my brother who, who I shared, I was, I live with my brother and I was sharing a flat with him in London. And my brother says to me, turn on the telly, Rod Hall has been murdered. And I said to him, if this is a fucking joke, then it's in really fucking poor taste, okay? And he said, no, I'm not, I wouldn't lie. I wouldn't lie about that. I wouldn't say that. And I said, what? So I turned on the telly, yeah, and lo and behold, he'd been murdered. What had happened was, Rod was into s and right? And he had like a sling and a kind of like arrangement in his flat. You know, he he bought this kind of flat that had like a clock tower in it and all this kind of malarkey. Right. And um, yeah, his lover, his young 19-year-old um, Muslim lover, um, murdered him while he while they were doing they were involved in an S and M. So of course, it, of course, he was in a compromised pr uh, position. Absolutely, it's completely, de com completely defenceless. Mm. So it was just appalling, absolutely appalling. And this 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 young man was obviously completely disturbed and a total psychopath. He he's in some sort of mental uh, sort of hospital for the criminally insane, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, and for for the foreseeable future. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I won't. I, I, I won't go into the grisly details. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know. I know. Yeah. Well, because because I don't want to. You know, I, I respect his family. I don't, yeah, don't. Yeah, but no, I mean. But no, anyway, I mean, but, what you said is completely enough and shocking and sensational in itself. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, yeah. That's the script in itself, isn't it? Well, yeah. People said, you know, people have said to me, "Oh, well, you know, why don't you write this?" And I said, "Well, no, no, I don't. I don't want to do that because it's just." I'd have to change it completely anyway, so I, I could do that just as a thing anyway, but uh, I certainly wouldn't ally it to um, what happened to Rod. Yeah. Well, um, what also, more do you want to know about also, that? Also, also what we want to talk about, Gary, was, mm. um, you know, this ghastly creature, what you call Sophie Robinson. Oh, God. This Labour councillor who puts a tweet out. I mean, this is a straight woman, by the way. She's not a, she's not a trans... She's not trans or she's not gay or anything like that. And she, so this is the tweet she put out. The GC movement, by which she means gender critical, by which she means people who oppose the uh, uh, trans extreme activists. Or gender ideology, yeah. Or gender ideology, yeah. So she says, the GC movement is slowly unraveling to expose its true identity. And let's be clear, they are, and always have been, anti-LGBT+. I hope this will be a wake-up for the vichy gays selling your soul to the enemy will never save you it just it just delays the oppression that is coming who the sodding hell does this woman think she is How, why does she presume to talk about gay matters indeed um i mean you, you want my take on that yeah please um, her, her use of the word vichy gays illustrates that she has no idea what she's talking about because vichy gays means People who betray get other. She, she's trying. To, she's. It's a trendy word that she's trying to uh, trying to uh, take over, commandeer. And what it what it means is gay people who who um, betray other gay people. Mm. Yeah, you know, that's what Vichy. You know, that's what Vichy France was. You know, that's I know, what yeah, I know exactly. No, but I, I I'd say that the gay traitors are the ones that are aligning themselves with the <laughs> trans ideology. Exactly. So, exactly. So what she's the game she's playing is classic Darvo. Um, you know, um, uh, um, where you kind of switch things around so that you accuse your enemies of something that you're much more guilty of. And that's the game she's playing. Um, deny, attack, reverse, um, become the victim. So the, the victimizer becomes the victim. Um, yeah, D-A-R-V, and the O is, you know... Um, well, what, they do, what they do, Gary, is they weaponize compassion, don't they? They have all this counter yeah, compassion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, and that's what she's doing. Can I just point out, we've only got five minutes left yeah. on this Zoom, unless we want to restart it, which is fine with me. No, 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 no. <laughs> Honestly, if I knew how to mute Sean, I would. Now you, started, you started it. <laughs> Hello, we're back after a short break, and we were talking about the subject of white middle-class woke women who uh, interfere in every aspect of people's lives, basically. So what do you think about that, Gary? And Sean? I'll tell you what, Sean, do you want to come in with that? Because you ended the last one with saying something about how they think they can stand up in front of the cameras and, and tell uh, lies um, just on the basis that they're women. I don't okay. think I meant to say they do it because they're women. I, I right. think my point is that it, there's a trend now that people have lost track of truth. Yeah. And it, it's OK if you assert something, providing you believe it and you assert it. In an emotive way, it, yeah. It, yes. It's so fact, though, true. And I I think there's a... That part of it is because I'm reasonably religious. There's a disconnection, I think, going on between what is true with a capital T and what people assert the truth to be. Yeah. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say it's women. I just think it's kind of prevalent. Mm -hmm. And... and <laughs> The, the paradigmatic example has to be what happened during lockdown, where people were just talking about the bollocks and the new. Oh, we had that, 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 that doctor. I think her name was Sarah, Sarah Kayat or something. Oh, we, she's awful. Oh God, she she went <clears throat> she went on uh, this morning, uh, the show this morning. Uh, eyes flickering, wild self righteous fury. Uh, I'd say seductively, but... Um, no, okay. she looked completely insane. She was crazy. She was like a Prozac but, crazed but, woman. That they to, answer, to answer Gary's point, I, I'd, I'd like to offer that uh, clarification. I just, I don't think it's a female-specific thing. I think it's just yeah. that we've lost... We <laughs> People don't really care about truth anymore. They think if no. you say something and you feel it, it must be true. And I... I yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that the left come up with these terms like post-truth when it comes to Trump or, oh God, who's that ghastly woman that's on the BBC? Mariano Spring, is it? Oh, well, yeah. she's the truth checker, isn't she? Yes. Truth yes. fact checker. Well, she's the ultimate gaslighting. Yeah. yeah, no, totally, totally. There's a lot of gaslighting going on, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. But no, I, Gary, I didn't mean it specifically... To be directed in terms of women it's just in general that, that yeah i can't no, think of many, uh, many, yeah, many i can't think of any mainstream broadcasters i would trust i i there are a few of us who operate outside the mainstream james occasionally tells the truth they edit it out whenever i do you know, I was, I was I was speaking about the French on one show, and they edited almost. Well, you don't trust them, do you? No, no, exactly. And so I was, I was edited, almost everything I said about the French was edited out. Yeah, Richie Allen, I, I think, think is quite good. Um... But what I, think, what I think, though, also the problem is that with X or Twitter, what you want to call it, given that one can't apologise without the feral lefties smelling blood and then and then doing a pile on. Never apologise to them. No, no, of course. Well, that, yeah, but that's a societal problem now, isn't it? Because we've lost, you know, we've lost the will to want to apologise once we've done something wrong and make amends. We can't do that now because we know that that's just going to give succour to our enemies. So you think you're apologising too, James, doesn't it? I mean, if you're genuinely sorry, then no, you if you, you know, even God. if you were genuinely but sorry, you can't sorry, God. admit it. Even if you were genuinely sorry, that's what I'm saying. You can't admit it now. You can't better yourself by putting mm -hmm. it out there that you did something wrong and you want to make amends. You can't do it now because you know that it's just you know that as I say, it's just going to give succor to your enemies. Well, you, you talked Derek, about Derek, you, talk, sorry, you, you, talk, you talked about religious. Um, uh, being being religious. I mean, one of the things that I understand religion is about is, of course, forgiveness. And what mm. is lacking mm. in this context is being forgiven for having done something wrong, or, or uh, you know, in what in, you don't get forgiven, you get condemned. Um, yes, you're right. Yeah, and and I think that that's a, that's really a very detrimental um, societally. I've written a list. 
<laughs> while, while we've had our little break, I've been writing a list, a checklist, um, white middle class woke women, and then I've got a list of things. <laughs> Which I just if I if you if you just yeah, indulge go on, me, please. if you if you just indulge me, I'll run through it. Mm -hmm. Right. The solicitors might it. become involved here, Gary. If uh, not what? <laughs> <laughs> the what? Or name them. Come on. Let's go no, 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 I'm not I'm not naming. I'm not naming. I'm just talking about syndromes. I'm talking about things that are apparent in terms of the way they seem to be operating these days. Mm -hmm. The first thing I'd like to say about them is that they're everywhere. They're yeah. everywhere. Omnipresent. They're on every show. They're on every fucking screen. Yes. They're just totally ubiquitous. Right? Yes. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they're incredibly ignorant and arrogant, most of them. Mm. They really don't know what they're talking about, but they talk about it as if, in the most arrogant terms, as if they do. And not only if they do, but they're going to assert it in no uncertain terms. But um, it's not... Sorry, go on. Yeah, go on. Sorry. It, it's, it's not an exclusively feminine... Issue, no, 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 it? I mean... no, 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 it's not. It's not. I'm just what I'm doing is I'm expounding on the, the point I'm making is that it's not exclusively about women, but it really is something that women are increasingly guilty yeah. of, increasingly, yes, uh, the worst perpetrators of. That's the worst perpetrators, mean. yes, it's more potent in, in more the... potent. And, 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 and the key point about that is that they're not being challenged, it's going unchallenged, mm -hmm. and there are reasons for that, they're getting away with it. Um, and they can say what they like about men. I mean, you can just you can you can't say anything about them, and but they can say what they like about men. What we've seen is is a rise in misandrist um, uh, views. Yes. Yeah. De most definitely, um, and they, they 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 get away with things like accusing anyone who criticizes them, particularly men, of misogyny, being sexist, of mansplaining, of being patriarchal, of being incels, of having a mm -hmm. small dick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also potential rapists or people who are in, you know, all men are implicated in rape. So they have a responsibility for, for, for men who rape, for all men have a responsibility for men who rape. This is like the most crass, old school, old style kind of rad femme militant bullshit that you yes. used to get in the 80s. And it's been resurrected, right? It's been resurrected. Um, and the other thing about them is- It's kind of like behind, reverse chauvinism as well. No, it totally is. And they hide behind their white privilege and think they can get a free pass on that because they are women. Yeah, it's the Marina Hyde syndrome. Yeah, no, absolutely, yes. absolutely. She's, she's, she's absolutely, absolutely awful. Yeah, yeah, she's dreadful. But she's, she's a typical she's a good writer. She's a good. Oh, she, writer. Oh, she, she's a good. She is a good witty writer. I, I'll give her that. But, but, but to, hear, to hear some of them rabbit on, you'd think that they were some sort of oppressed minority or something. Yeah, no, I know, I know. And she went to, you, you know, she went to Oxbridge and, you know, she had all the privileges going. Mm. And, and she, but you see, this is what they hide behind. They hide behind the fact that they're women. They think they, you know, they think it gives them a free pass to anything and you can't accuse them of anything, particularly men. If you're a man who tries to accuse any of these women of being an idiot or being wrong or being arrogant or, you know, then you just get the fact that you're a man thrown straight back in your face. And the problem is that too many men, too many what I would call cuck men, Mm. Um, you know, they they, they don't chat, they, they go along with they they suffer, they there, side, there are, they there side are, with them, they side yeah. with them, attacking the man who's challenging them. Well, no, Karen, there, there, are, there are something are... funny now about about Marina Hyde. Yeah, go on. I wrote an yeah. article for Daniel Johnson's magazine, The Art, which actually is called The Article, mm. where I I I think I I thought I was slagging her off, not slagging her off, but just gently taking the piss. Yeah, in a Marina High slightly way that that, mm. that she does, and mm. I can be sarcastic when I write, uh, yeah. you know. So I'm not I'm not completely um, incompetent at that. I got her fucking name wrong, didn't I? I've, I've confused her with Marina Warner. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And the editor oh. just said to me, "Are you sure you're talking about the right person?" I thought, oh, "No." <laughs> Goodness me. He had to take the... All right, James, you, we've all made mistakes. Yeah, but, you know, the thing is, they're all the same, aren't they, these marinas? Yeah. I don't think Marina Warner's OK. Marie, <laughs> Marina Hyde, Mariana Spring, they're ind indistinguishable from one another. They're just like... Well, they're all... They've all they're like this kind of, like, alien entity, like... Um, what, what, invasion of the Body Snatchers? Invasion of the Body, body Snatchers, snatchers. Yeah, that, yeah. That's basically it with these women. Yeah. And... Well, there was that line from uh, Orwell's 1984, 
where he said the most bigoted adherents of the party, the most extreme ones, basically, were young women. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. can, can I just add something? There's, there's one more thing on my list, which I think is particularly salient to what we're talking about here, given that there's two gay men here, is mm. that these women, these white middle class woke women, think they seem to think they have the right to pontificate about gay men and gay politics can i just interject here so yeah, yeah. Robbins. Uh, is 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 gary saying he's gay he's you know, he's 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 one so of I'm, them so he's i'm outnumbered them. here he's one of them sean yes gary so. i knew i knew that i'm just i'm just being an arsehole sorry yeah no it's it's okay I, it's okay you know whatever i'm, I'm joking I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't give a fuck. You know, I mean, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not I mean, one. you know, I mean, you know, I, I, well, I won't say what I was going to say actually because it's a bit much. But uh, no, say it. Otherwise, I'll feel well, bad. You know, the, listen. You know, I, as far as I, I don't believe in the, you know, I don't believe in the LGBTQ Rainbow Reich agenda. I see them. I, I coined the the in one of my articles. Oh. I, called, I called them the KGBT. Mm, that's quite good, actually. And and so and basically yes, so it didn't go down very well. And and the thing is, you know, there are plenty of gay, I've met plenty of gay people in my time who I wouldn't piss on if they were on fire, Sean. You know, oh, some, some of some of them was, all I was people. making. I was saying on the last podcast, ill-tempered Ill joke. I, I I knew I knew where you were coming. You don't need to apologise, Sean. It's fine. Yeah, no, don't. I'll apologise. Hey, if I want to apologise, this, this I'll really, If you're really... going to apologise again, Sean, then I'm kicking you out <laughs> of this podcast. Yeah, don't, don't, don't apologise. Don't apologise on my, my. Behalf. How can you kick me out of this podcast when joint podcasters? Yes, He's going to do it now, right. Gary. He's going to boot me out. <laughs> no, no, you won't. You won't. I'm not going to. Have... I will stand in solidarity Sean, with you, Sean. I am not going to have a gay apologist on this show. Well, that's because you don't like gay people. <laughs> Not most of them. I like Gary. <laughs> they can hold court on. I don't, a I don't know. I don't know where they but, summon but they the are nerve. I don't know where, where they summon the nerve to speak with such or, assumed authority. I know. I know. Matters. And they talk a right load of old bollocks. You know, basically. I mean, they just do. It's just nonsense that they talk. They have no idea about the reality of being gay men. And it's and what really gets sticks in the craw is that you can't do it the other way around. You can't start pontificating about you know that, that, that if they well, listen, if, if they were to listen to what we've been saying, they would be completely outraged and up in arms and trying to ban us. Ooh, what of it? What are they going to do? I don't give a rotten <laughs> fig about them. There's yeah, nothing they can do to me. I know. Yeah, quite exactly. There's nothing they can do to me either. I'm retired, mate. You know. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, Gary, I'm, can I can I ask you a question yeah. before we have to? Um, well, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, seriously impressed by what you said about the nature of script writing, but yes. is it yes. different yes. when you're writing something that's specifically humorous okay. and how how it can subvert normal narratives and how humor is something that should be taken seriously? So I've got when, a great you, quote, when you were writing, I got a great quote human. about that, Sean. I got a great Very quote good. about that, which I'll share with you. Ed Gwynn, who was an old um, uh, film director in the Hollywood studios, Jewish, yeah. and he was on his deathbed, like, he was dying, and all the people around him was, you know, it was all lamentations and all, oh, you know, isn't it awful, blah blah blah. And he got so sick of people, one a procession of people coming in and sympathising with him and blah blah blah. And he said, "Oh, for God's sake, death is easy. Comedy is difficult." Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> Can I steal that? Yeah. And I thought that was, that's just one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. Because I, I, I think humour is the proper way to take the world seriously. Is well, to what's really that great it's about that quote, Sean, absurd. What's really great about that quote, Sean, is that it's very funny in itself. Right? Yeah, it is. It's a yeah. very funny thing here to say. Oh, for God's sake, dying is easy. Comedy is difficult. So well, that, that's, that, that's one of the things I would say about comedy is that it's really difficult. And how, have, have, you ever, I mean, have you ever have you ever tried that, Gary? Have you written a script that's comedian? No, no, I haven't. I, ha I have humorous scenes mm, or yeah. things, humorous things that characters do, or humorous lines, but I've never actually sat down and written an actual comedy. No. Yeah. I mean, one of the things about comedy writing is that um, instead of opposites attract. The best comedy comes out of opposites repulse when it comes to characters. 
Right. So like those two characters in Father Ted who hate each other. Yes. But pretend, <laughs> but pretend exactly. to love each other as soon as the, the police turns the, the up. Best com- the best comedy comes out of hatred, mutual hatred. And mutual well, hatred. When, well, whenever Sean and I wish one another dead and come up with new creative ways of killing each other, everyone thinks it's just an act that we're doing it as a, some form of joke, but no, we're, complete, we're entirely sincere. <laughs> yeah. we? I've, 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 I've actually hired the hitman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. James, I love you. You know, you know I'm you, joking. Sean. Oh, don't make me admit that. No, this has been far <laughs> too soppy. I'm going to go anyway, but this yeah. has been brilliant. Yeah, it has. Oh, it has. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Gary. And don't worry, I'll, I'll um, edit. If there's anything wrong with the recording then I'll edit it out I'm sorry I've not been very talkative today but as I say I'm just so hideously hungover James there's absolutely no reason why you should apologise for not being talkative <laughs> oh no no it's it's, no, it's, 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 it's I, can you, to I, I can assure you that I think it's become as a welcome relief yes yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs>